any record on audacity okay okay all right it says recording okay so um i'll read your bio and then we'll just start asking you questions okay it doesn't show anything on zencaster for me um, it doesn't show um like, like it says waiting for host to join oh okay let me let me see what happens if i you told me I didn't need to go in there, but I bet I, I do need to go in there, the producer. Um, but since he made the link, I have a feeling that he's the host. Mm -hmm. it says Aaron. Um, yeah, let's tell him. This is so fun. I don't think I've ever done a. Really? I've, I've interviewed, like, I've had a co-host on the podcast before we claim, and we did two people with one interview, but I don't think I've ever been a recipient. So this is kind of fun. Oh, oh. let me copy link. Yeah, it gets, there's a lot of layers of this technology yeah, going you, on here. You but. two are doing all of the things, it's very impressive. <laughs> We're doing uh, all of the things. <laughs> Trust me, it's less impressive than you might think. <laughs> Let's see. Where are you located? Tell you. I'm in LA. Oh, okay. I'm in Orange County. Nice. Yeah. Costa yeah. Mesa. Costa Mesa. Nice. Yeah, I don't know why. When you're from Orange County, you always say Orange County instead of like a city, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm down here. Yeah. It's like the cool thing to say. Like, I'm in Orange County. I don't know. I don't know why. I always have, too. It's just... Well, it's a very fancy county. Well, I think it's just people <laughs> know it now because maybe of the show in the past yeah. or whatever. Yeah. It's easy. I just say it that way, I guess. Yeah start saying yeah. claim it <laughs> you're not the only one but um yeah i'm in la proper so. okay cool yeah all right so, so close yet i'd never make it down there i feel like almost ever yeah it's Except for the airport <laughs> it's, it's it takes a commitment to get it, it really specific. does yeah a time frame you have to be within and out in a certain amount of time oh yeah if you struggle you're <laughs> fucked <laughs> yeah you're waiting till like 9 p.m yeah. Yeah. All right. Jade's got two toddlers, so as you can tell, <laughs> she, she's making sure they're in, in There's bed. a child outside my outside. Oh, somebody uh, else. I don't know why. Um, Daisy, zip it. And I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm, oh. I can put her outside. Um, it should probably be worse out there. So Zencaster is still giving you issue? Now it says that Jade Bryce is waiting for microphone access. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here I'm in. So. But now it says uh, waiting for a host to join. Okay. So. Do I need to join that too, Jade? Or is it just no. John that needs to join it, really? No, you don't. Hold on one second. Whoa. <laughs> Do you have headphones on, Tice? I can't. Yeah, I have. Um... Okay, cool. I just can't see. Tice, I'm sorry. <laughs> Told you about the technology and together being together. <laughs> it's just, it's a part of how this works. Oh my God, you guys. Holy God. So sorry. There's a wiener dog that got on my patio. <laughs> Um, okay, it says waiting for us to join. I think he has to join. Hold it in. You want me to call him? Or you can probably go on Zencaster and just send another link. Um, hmm. I can't. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, we changed the way that we've been recording, so... Let me see. Oh, I think I only have his. Dang it. I think I only have his. Um... It's interesting that you guys do both. I usually only do Zoom. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we could just do Zoom. It's another option, Jade. We can just do Zoom, I guess. Um... Hi, John. Um, we are on with Thais right now about to record, but the Zencaster link is saying that 
host has to be um, Mercedes, I think let's on. Just do Zoom because Can we just record on Zoom? That's what we did for Dr. Shafali. He said he just clicked on. You guys see that? No. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, now so it's working. working. Cool. That worked. So just can you keep it on? Okay, cool. Sounds good. Thank you. I don't need to be on that one though, right? Because you no. got me. I'm doing Audacity. You have Audacity. Okay, so sorry. Cool. All right. Thanks, John. We switched up everything. All right. Talk to you later. Um, to try to make it easier for the guest. But now we're working out the kinks and it. <laughs> That's totally good. <laughs> we're a guinea pig. Sorry. It's totally good. I'm happy to be the guinea pig. <laughs> so everything's recording now. Okay. So you got on. Zencaster, Audacity, and Zoom. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. All right. So we'll read your bio intro and then we'll start asking you questions. Okay. One more thing. Sorry to be picky. Jade, your audio sounds weird to me. It sounds a little you know, echoey. Yours does too, because we're both on Zen. Uh, oh, this happened with Dr. Shafali, remember? Mm -hmm. And that's why we only recorded Zoom. Do you I'm, I'm listening to you in two different places. Yep. That's what happened with Dr. Shafali. Then I think we're okay with just Zoom. Okay. So sorry. Okay. It's okay. So it's we'll close thing. out Zen. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. That was it. That is. Yep. I forgot. That is what happened with Shafali and with Brandon Duncan, remember? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. and Tacey, are you on a mic or are you just on your computer's mic? I'm on this mic. If that you mic. like, I can. Well, hold on. Look at, look at you. Oh, oh, wow. I have my own podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have that handy. Oh, yeah. Hold on. So then when you, once you get that plugged in, go to the bottom left of your Zoom. Um, yeah, I know. Okay. I got Mercedes. All I got right. it. <laughs> okay. It connected immediately automatically. Awesome. So let me just. Okay. Okay. Now I got a black fuzzy. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> So let me introduce an esteemed life coach, international speaker, and mindfulness teacher. She is a true speaker and healer on a heart-led mission to support the seekers of the world reclaim their sense of belonging. She coaches women on how to explore, trust, and express themselves unapologetically, and to heal what she calls the worthiness wound. Her journey began in attending to her own childhood trauma and has led her to study emotional resilience, somatic therapy, social justice, and spiritual psychology in search for sovereignty and healing. She has spoken on stages around the world and is a soon-to-be author. Her credentials include formerly consulting for the U.S. government, and she's received a prestigious first-class degree in management and has since built a thriving business, which was nominated for 2017 Forbes 30 Under 30 Award. She is currently back in school to receive a master's in clinical psychology. She also hosts a weekly podcast called Reclaim, and the Huffington Post calls her an inspirational woman, and we cannot wait for you to find out why. So please help me welcome Thais Skye. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Probably the longest bio we've ever read. I know. You're <laughs> it is so fun to listen to my own bio. <laughs> I bet. So oh, it's one heck of a resume. And I, I do want to get into the details of your own story and how you've dealt with your own trauma. But first, maybe to kick off the show, you could define for us and our listeners what the type of trauma that you deal most with is, like define what trauma is and how and why it affects each of us differently. Mm. Well, trauma has become such a, a buzzword and it's become mm. um, so, it's, it's, it's removed from, I think, the more clinical, the um, where the word comes from now and it's become such a common understanding of anything that kind of activates and, and um, alters the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to go with. This isn't like a, the clinical definition of trauma, but the way that I understand trauma is an event that we perceive as a threat to ourself. And it alters the way that we then understand the world. Um, and so there's always a, um, a nervous response, um, 
the nervous system has to be activated. And we usually don't know how to process what's happening. Um, and that's what lands as trauma in the body. So for me, I, my work is focused on this concept of the worthiness wound, which is a concept that I developed after extensive amount of research and work in the field of attempting to understand why it is that um, amazing, powerful, badass women, right? Women who kind of on the outside have everything that it takes for them to be successful and to go after what they want, um, find themselves in this paralyzing sense of inadequacy and unworthiness. Um, and there is a deep connection between the worthiness wound and trauma. Most often what we find is that in order for us to have most of us who have a worthiness wound also have a sense that who we are is not okay and how we navigate the world is not okay. And that typically comes from trauma. But I don't, um, I don't want to confound the two because I want to make sure that when we're talking about the worthiness wound that we're really accessing an emotional space within us mm -hmm. that may or may not activate the nervous system, but it certainly lands for us as a way that we're seeing the world where we feel like who we are is not okay. So this isn't just like a momentary, like, oh, I got a new job. I kind of feel inadequate. It's more of like a deep sense that who I am is so deeply flawed. Like everyone else got the book of life of how to navigate the world, except for me, that type of feeling. Is that usually rooted somewhere deep in your childhood? Typically, yeah. And there's a lot of variables and a lot of um, uh, um, words are slipping me tonight, um, uh, elements of the worthiness wound. But yeah, most of what we find is that if we did not develop a foundation of worthiness in our childhood, it's very hard for us to have a foundation of worthiness in our adulthood. And mm -hmm. so most of the times what we'll find is that if we look at the worthiness wound and if we dig deeper, it's stemming from childhood. Yeah. So, so what about your story? What brought you to this work? Yeah. So, um, you know, I developed an eating disorder um, in college. It was never formally diagnosed. So I call it disordered eating, but it was a, a pattern of a relationship with food that was pretty detrimental. And I had no idea what to make of it. Um, I kind of came from at that point, like a life where I thought was privileged and great. And like, yeah, I had some hard times in childhood. I, I immigrated to the United States when I was seven from Brazil and left my family behind. And um, so there was like some bumps on the road, but I thought all in all, like my parents did the best that they could and childhood was great. And so being in college and having this um, disordered eating and, and kind of confusing relationship with food really um, propelled me into this downward spiral of, of, um, complete like who the who the hell am I like who am I what is going on here um, and so I started going to um, uh, work with a therapist with a healer and we worked together for gosh 10 years and what she helped me uncover was that you know my understanding of life was very much affected by how I understood life as a child. So how I, how I was related to as a child affects who you are as an adult. Mm -hmm. And the more I did my own healing around um, my eating disorder and, and my relationship with my body and my relationship with myself, I started getting into yoga and wellness. And um, I started to understand about wellness coaching and health coaching. So I decided to become a health coach. And then that led me to become a life coach. And now I'm getting my master's in clinical psych. And it's all been just this... Um, commitment to trying to understand myself and trying to understand the psychology of women. And what I found was that again and again, it seems like even if we have the right mindset, even if we have the right marriage and the, we're making the money that we want and you know, we kind of are living the life that we've been told that we should have to be happy, we're still finding that there's a place within us that feels like we don't really deserve it and that mm -hmm. we're we're really quite inadequate and we're really not okay. And so what is that? What is that phenomenon? And I became so curious about it because that's what was exper I was experiencing where, you know, in the coaching industry, it's everything is so tantalizing, this idea that like, you just got to get out of your own way. And you can do mm -hmm. that by just having the right thoughts, you know, and if you have the right thoughts, you'll manifest the right things, and then everything will be good. And I really got bought into it. And yet it wasn't working for me. And I got so frustrated, like, I was a believer in manifestation, I was a believer in mindset work, and yet nothing was working. 
Mm. And that's when I became a more of an explorer of the shadows and like, what does it mean to kind of integrate this, the dirtier parts of ourselves, the more shameful parts of ourselves? What does it mean to um, activate a sense of worthiness that doesn't have to do with kind of like the capitalistic notions of money and wealth? What does it look like um, when we uh, kind of intertwine privilege and um, uh, race and um uh, fat phobia and, and transphobia, uh, like what happens when we intersect all those things? Like what's at the core of the human experience? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been my story and it continues to unfold and I continue to be so fascinated by like, what does it mean to be a uh, human in this messy world? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were you, it may have been, cause you're one of my favorite pages to follow. And I know a lot about what you post has to do around trauma. And I can't remember if it was you that posted this, but someone posted Trauma is anything less than nurturing. Mm. Was that you? And if not, do you? No, that wasn't me, but I love that. Um, here's the thing. It's it, trauma typically in childhood is a relational injury. Um, and so if it's a relational injury, then it makes a lot of sense that kind of the opposite of trauma would be nurturance. So mm -hmm. I understand a lot of my work through kind of attachment theory, which has become kind of like a more popular, mm -hmm. it's become very pop psychology. But what I love about attachment theory is that what it tells us is that human beings are wired for connection. Yeah. You know, we are wired to want to biologically connect to other people. In fact, as a baby, it's imperative that we learn how to connect to our caregivers. It's mm -hmm. typically our mothers, but not always, of course. Um, but if we are not able to connect with our mothers, that causes a dis-ease in our bodies. That causes a dis-ease in our minds. That could be because of circumstances. It could be because of our caregiver. It could become be a variety of factors. But I, I love that. Yeah. I think 100% on point in that our relationships, particularly in childhood, determines our resiliency and our capacity to then 100%. kind of navigate trauma as an adult. Yeah, that we had Maddie Moon on who we love and she said that she was, you know, she doesn't preach the whole like you have to be whole before you can have someone else and mm. um, that it's okay to crave that connection. And it was so comforting to me because I think she was the first person I ever heard say that because yeah. I thought that something wasn't right with me because I, I crave connection and I crave um, that partnership. And so um, I really uh, enjoyed that talk with her, but I was I also, I love Maddie. And I, yeah, I'm so glad that you said that because I think it's really important that we recognize that this idea that in order for us to like be loved, we have to love ourselves. It, it, it places, it, it is devoid of complexity, mm -hmm. which is that oftentimes when we're feeling the most unloved, the way that we are reminded of our lovability is other people's love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I love talking about needs and neediness because I think that that is something that is so often labeled on people who are more emotionally in tune with themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, we're afraid of being needy. We're afraid of needing others. We're afraid of, um, yeah, of having needs. And it's important for us to recognize that wherever we have um, a large sense of like, I don't have enough of this. Mm -hmm. It's because we literally don't have enough of it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like if we, yeah. if we feel like we don't have, like we need love, it's because we don't feel like we have enough love. Right. And so th there's no problem in that. Mm -hmm. We do have to just then look at what's preventing me from letting that love in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe so also waves. So <laughs> in the attachment styles. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. also uh, recognizing that when you're asking someone else for the love or saying, I need to get it from this outside source, just like um, you hear the common, you hear the, the, the thought mentioned of you can't recognize um, something in someone else if it doesn't already reside within you. Hmm. So noticing that you need this thing outside of you, or you think you need this thing outside of you is really a, a ask for yourself to look inside and figure out how you can create that for yourself or create the space for it for yourself or create yeah. something. Be open to it at the least. Yeah. Yeah. I have always felt like a, like, like a kind of a needy person. Um, and always like, um, I'm too much, mm -hmm. but also not enough. 
mm-hmm. which is so complex. And I've always felt like I'm just too much for someone to understand. Um, there's too much depth in different directions in here. Mm-hmm. And um, so I really, really relate to your message. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I wanted to ask um, about how to prevent um, passing trauma onto our children. But um, really quick, I was going to share with you um, this last weekend at an Aya ceremony. Um, I was feeling that way, like feeling like I can't, I can't be mis- I can't be understood by people, and that it was one of the reasons why I lose my temper with my kids and raise my voice is because if they're not hearing me, it like triggers that. Can anyone hear me? Can anyone understand me? Well, it's because you weren't heard, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a simple it's that's, trauma. It's, trauma of not being heard, right? That's hundred percent. Yeah. So um, then I spent time with four people. The medicine took me to spend time with four people. Mercedes was one of them um, who do understand me, and I felt that connection, and it was very healing. One of them was um, my best friend Tom Shadyak, and when I spent time with him, I became this like really intricate, like game of Thrones looking ship that had every animal you can imagine that made, made it up. And instead for the first time ever, instead of feeling like this is too much for someone, instead I felt who could get bored? What an adventure, you know, and it was really, really healing. So um, I know as women, we tend to feel like we're too much and not enough, like I said, but um, that can be also such a great thing. So, yeah. And you know, this idea, this feeling of too much. So let's break it down again in childhood. You know, if a baby is crying and they get their needs met, if a baby is angry or a toddler is angry and the mom gets angry with the toddler, this is called mirroring, mm. right? Like when a baby is crying mm. and the mother is holding, nurturing, mm-hmm. um, that's called like holding, but mirroring is a special skill of like, if you, if I, you should try this sometime, you know, Jade, if you don't already, it's like when your toddler or your child is throwing a tantrum to throw a tantrum with them. Mm. Cause what's happening is you're showing you them, feel heard. you're showing them what they're doing. Mm-hmm. We don't have that self-perception as a child to know what we're doing. So when a parent or an adult or a caregiver mirrors to the child what they're doing, you can do this also by saying it, like you're angry right now, right? We're mirroring to the child what they're experiencing. Mm-hmm. What they feel is that you can contain it, that mm-hmm. you can hold it, right? Mm-hmm. That, you, that you have the capacity to be with their feelings. Mm-hmm. The too muchness comes when we don't get that. When we feel like our anger pushes away our parents, Mm -hmm. when we feel like something that we do or say um, makes them turn away from us in some way. Now we're told that this feeling that we're not being mirrored is too much because it cannot be contained. The consequence of it is detachment, right? It's a rupture in the attachment and we Mm -hmm. can't tolerate that. And so then we feel like we have to suppress it and then we feel like it's too much. That's when we feel like were too much. And Mm -hmm. so there's an important distinction that I want to make, particularly around trauma. You know, you're saying, Jade, that you don't feel heard. There's a difference between um, our feelings are data, not direction, right? I say this often that our our feelings are information, but they're not telling us what's actually happening. So sometimes we get confused. We think I'm not being heard. No one is hearing me, but that's actually not what's happening. What's happening is that you feel not heard. And there's a huge difference because Mm -hmm. when you feel not heard and you can own it, that it's your experience, Mm -hmm. you can explore it and you can determine if it's actually reality based or if it's just a feeling, if it's trauma, it's all you see. All you see is that you're not being heard and then you react from that place. Mm -hmm. So giving ourselves space to feel however we feel, honor what we're feeling, tending to the little girl within us who's not feeling heard allows us to then open up to the ways that we are actually being heard. And in the ways that we're not being heard, communicate our expectations and our boundaries clearly. Um, But while we're operating this narrative that I'm not heard and having that be a truth instead of your own experience of it, the reality, right, then we're going to be continually perpetuating the pattern from childhood of Mm -hmm. not being heard, you know, and then pushing away and then shutting down and then getting angry, you know, and then whatever the pattern happens to be. So how do you tend to that little girl? 
So um, this is called like reparenting or learning how to parent our inner child. And um, this work is like really, really, really profound. And what we're acknowledging when we're doing this work is recognizing that we all have a little person inside of us who's frozen in time at a time when they didn't know how to process what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, so like, you know, it could be something very benign to the adult um, adult brain. Like we can look back and be like, that wasn't such a big deal, but it's to us as a child, it may have been a huge deal. We didn't know how to process it. And so now that part of us is frozen in time, unable to move on. Mm -hmm. um, and so reparenting looks like learning how to tend to her and mother to her the way that we were not mothered, the way that we were not tended to. So for you, Jade, it would look like listening to her. Wherever mm -hmm. she, like, whenever you feel this energy of like, I'm not being heard, you know, taking a moment, connecting with her within yourself and tending to her and hearing her. What is it that we're, I'm not hearing from you. Let me be here. Let me support you. Let me mirror to you or let me hold you. Let me be here with you as you're throwing your tantrum about not being heard. Mm. Um, and as we do that, what we're doing is we're cultivating two things. We're giving ourselves permission to have the shadowy, messy part of us that we are all trying to kind of deny and pretend doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And we're also actually uh, cultivating our, uh, our capacity to be adults, right? We're, we're developing an emotional maturity of being able to hold a part of our experience without letting that be all of our experience. Mm. And we're also learning how to relate to ourselves in a different way. We're in, in an aspect like unhooking ourselves from an expectation that our caregiver, particularly our mother, is going to change and somehow now be who we want them to be. And instead, we're reorienting that energy into how we can nurture ourselves, hold ourselves in the way that's supportive. Yeah. So what does the actual action look like with the toddler? I mean, well, you, you have the tantrum with them, for instance, and then... How do you end that so that they understand, hmm. you know, how to process what just happened? Um, so, you know, there's, a, so first, let me back up. So the best way that we kind of start this work, and this is new for anybody who's listening, you know, the best way to start this work is through a guided meditation where you're guided to meet your little girl or your little boy or, you know, your little non-binary child within you, you know, this is a, this doesn't have to be a gendered experience, but um, you are guided to meet this little being inside of you. And there's so many meditations available online, all over free ones. Um, I have one on my website. I mean, there's so many amazing things, resources out there. So doing a guided visual, like visualization meditation of your little girl helps to you introduce yourself to her because what you're doing is you're developing a new relationship with her mm -hmm. um so it in order to start a relationship you have to meet her right you have to get to know her you have to introduce yourself to her um usually in particularly in my guided meditation but most guided meditations you're invited to meet her in a place that she feels very safe Mm. So recall in your mind's eye a time in your childhood where you felt very safe. Maybe that's um, a childhood bedroom or in school if home didn't feel safe for you or a playground, wherever she felt most um, safe and secure. And mm -hmm. typically when you close your eyes and meet her after the guided meditation, that's where you're going to find her. Mm. Um, and so, okay, so in the moment that Jade is feeling unheard, the invitation, of course, is to take a few breaths. Um, if you can step away, step away. If not, kind of deal with the situation the best way that you can, being very tender with yourself, that you're activated, kind of acknowledging that there's an activation, mm. acknowledging that there's some flared up feelings, um, giving yourself the opportunity to kind of navigate it with grace, knowing that it will be imperfect because you're activated, um, and then doing your best to kind of step away if possible. If not, at the end of the day, where, whenever you can, take a moment, close your eyes, and see if you can bring her, her, her image into your mind's eye. And yeah, so in that moment, let's say if Jade was able to kind of step away, she closed her eyes, you know, and she saw her little girl throwing a tantrum about not being heard. And so like, what would you have loved your mom to have done at that moment? You know, maybe you would have loved for your mom to mirror you and throw a tantrum with you, or maybe just to be there present with you, or mm -hmm. maybe it's to hold you, right? It's whatever you want, mm -hmm. or you wanted your mom to do. That's right. what, what you're now invited to do. Um, and so it's giving yourself, it can be 30 seconds, it can mm -hmm. be be five, 10, 20, however long you want it to be, of just doing that, of doing what you really feel like you wish your caregiver did to you yeah. and you bring it to yourself. So that may mean um, holding her um, and just letting that be a part of the experience and then saying kind words to her, like, you're okay, this is okay. Um, and then being able to move on. 
Mm. I like to also remind myself because I know my inner child comes out, um, you know, in conflict or when I'm feeling abandonment, I like to remind myself that I also now have this wise woman that Mm. when my inner child speaks up or cries out Mm -hmm. that because I now have this wise woman, I can have her tell that, that inner child, you know, what she needs to hear in that moment, like right at that moment. And if I call on that wise woman, there's like, I feel my anxiety kind of, Hmm. you know, I love that. That's so beautiful. I love that very much. So with the, um, having the tantrums with the top, with your, your toddlers, um, not the one within, but the ones in front of you, (laughs) would that be your number one tool for how to not pass on the trauma? I think the mind, I mean, okay, so first off, I am not a mother. So I bow to mothers. Mm-hmm. I, you know, do not pretend to know anything about being an actual mother. I've cried twice to today. Humans. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even like, um, but I would say that my number one kind of thought around how to not pass on trauma to your child is to do your own work. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That's it. It's like, you know, things, you're going to mess up your child. That's inevitable. (laughs) It's, I think, a part of the human experience. We're not here to have the perfect human experience. We're here to kind of navigate our brokenness. And so we get to thank our mothers for passing on their brokenness onto us. And we're going to pass on our brokenness to our child. So we kind of have to be tender with that fact because I know that that's hard. And I know that there's a lot of perfectionist tendencies that I hear around um, circles with mothers. And there's a lot of resources out there on how to be the perfect mom. There's a lot of shame. Yeah, I hear all that. Um, But the best thing that we can do is do our own work. Because when we do our own work, we develop a deeper relationship with our partner. And our relationship with our partner is the most important thing that we can do to show a child how to have intimacy, how to have connection, how to deal with ruptures and repairs. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so like, it's so important for us to be committed to doing our own inner work. Um, That it's not a bulletproof kind of thing, of course not, but it's the best. I think the best thing that we can do for ourselves and um, the generations to come. Yeah. 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 I think that probably bleeds over into all relationships we're involved in, even with our own parents in front of our, Mm -hmm. you know, our kids watch those relationships too. I'm sure a lot or any, any, even our friends, you know, close friends of the family, all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, I know we already talked about this a little bit, but, um, you did an amazing series on your show about reclaiming worth. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk to us about that about, and the worthiness wound as you like? Yeah. Yeah. It really resonates with me. So, um, I loved that series. That was a lot of fun. And, um, so the worthiness wound, right, is this deep sense of inadequacy. It's an emotional wound. Um, and so the Reclaiming Worth series was all about how to kind of understand it, unpack it, navigate it, different concepts, different ways that we can look at ourselves. Um, and I think the most important thing that I can say is that I think most of us, wherever we have this place where we feel inadequate and kind of, um, broken and, and insufficient, et cetera. I think our tendency is to want to diminish it. Mm. It's kind of, there's a lot of shame around it. So we want to kind of tuck it away and pretend like we're fine. There's a whole mentality, you know, faking it till you make it type mm-hmm. thing, like pretend like you're not inadequate and then you'll over, you know, you'll, you'll gain the confidence. But personally, this is my kind of perspective on things. I don't think any time that we try to pretend like there's not an experience happening inside of us, that that's the most effective way that we can kind of navigate our lives. Um, I think all experiences within us is informing us. It's all information. Um, And it's not always the appropriate time, but there's always a time to find a moment to do the work of investigating what is the inadequacy here? You know, what is the fear here? And so that's, this is what I call like exploring our shadows is like, instead of pretending like we don't have these uncomfortable experiences or emotions, what if these uncomfortable experiences and emotions were literally the doorway Mm -hmm. to our greatest healing? Mm -hmm. You know, this idea, like, okay, so like, let's back up. So like, if we're like just starting yoga for the first time or like entering the spiritual world, we kind of hear this phrase a lot of like, go within, right? Like all of the answers are within, which I love that. Like, that's so holy, so beautiful, so amazing. But what does that actually mean? Right? Right. Like if, if, 
we think of, again, if we're talking about spiritual concepts and we understand that like our internal landscape is as vast as the universe, right? We hear that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the universe is a really vast state. <laughs> where, where are we, we going? You right. know, if you don't have direction, like it's just easy to become lost. And yeah. so this idea of the answer lies within can be very confusing if we don't know where to start. Overwhelming so, for sure. Yeah. I'm always under the kind of understanding that like, great. So where are you most triggered? Like, where are you most activated? Where are you feeling the most uncomfortable? Where are the feelings that are coming up that are feeling the most yucky inside, right? I don't like the idea of negative or positive emotions. I don't believe that they're negative or positive, but there's feelings that are more uncomfortable to feel. That's where I think lies our work. It's the invitation for integration, right? So it's like, wherever you're activated with it, wherever you're triggered, that's, that's the invitation yeah. to the deeper work. Yes. Yeah take that direction mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. it's right there it's arrows pointing towards really something powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah and I think once you uncover that and you can work through that it points you in the direction next of whatever the next layer is you need to 100% get involved in and it can yeah. that can be so um useful just in daily life like it doesn't have to be this huge um you know inner searching it can be like that one person that bothers us at work okay well they're a mirror why do they trigger me mm -hmm. what what are they you know what is unhealed in myself that makes them bug the heck out of me especially you know? especially when it's a pattern that you notice or something that's reoccurring mm -hmm. that you notice you get triggered on maybe by multiple people maybe by the same person maybe it's you know a, a parent or someone really close to you that you don't talk to anymore because they trigger you so damn much you can't even look at it anymore mm -hmm. that's probably first on the list of what you need to look at you know yeah and like I will say, I don't know, I personally have sometimes a little problem with this idea of saying that people are mirrors mm. only because I think that we're, we're not mirrors in that if you look at me, you, you don't see yourself, you see a right. different person. Mm -hmm. And I think that we forget that I, in, in the relationship, there is you, there's also me. And then there's a thing that's activating in you. There's a thing that's activating in me. And mm -hmm. so when we look at as things are only mirrors, then it kind of unhooks the other person mm -hmm. from the damage that they may be doing. You know, so if we say, oh, that person is, you know, bothering me at work, yeah. it's because they're here for our own stuff, then we're not maybe taking, we're not really looking at how they may be responsible for certain actions that are hurting us. So in some ways, mm -hmm. it's like a martyr, a way that we're kind of taking on all the responsibility. And I'm not saying that that's what the meaning is. I'm just saying that's what our, I think many people's propensity is. Like we're mm -hmm. already kind of um, quick to take responsibility. That sounds really well with me because then we also aren't choosing to become a victim as well. Um, because the, the two instances that I can think of with this is like the two, um, two people that I work with that have a very similar personality that seem to bully everybody. Mm -hmm. They trigger the heck out of me and I close up around them. And so my whole perspective this whole time has been, well, why am I being triggered? Maybe I bully myself. Maybe um, I still need to heal from bullying I had as a child instead of, you're right, instead of maybe... Um, maybe it's them. them. Responsibility. Maybe yeah. exactly rigorous saying. authenticity. Yeah, and surrendering the outcome. And <laughs> maybe yeah. It. So yeah, all those things them. could be true, Jane. Right. All those things are valid and true. And what's also true is that they're jerks. <laughs> what's true is that the opportunity here is to put in place certain boundaries or at least communicate your needs in a way for them to know that you're not going to let them jerk you around. Right? right. So it's, that's what I love about thinking of life through a lens of relationship mm -hmm. where it's always what's mine and what's not mine. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. we're too quick to take everything on as mine. Mm -hmm. You know, I had, I just had this conversation earlier with my partner where I um, been thinking I've been having some health issues and I was talking to him and I was like, you know, like, I just have to think about like, what's the spiritual lesson here? Like what am I thinking about or doing that's like contributing and like, you know, somehow there's a lesson to learn here. Yeah. You and sound he, like Jade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he <laughs> me a little bit and he was like, oh, so you want to make this your fault? Uh -huh. Oh, so this is now your fault. Oh, good. <laughs> so now this gets to be your fault that you get to fix and then you get to feel in control and then you get to feel better about life. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, that's, I think, what we're doing if we're just not thinking about also that some things aren't our faults and some I, things are other people's things. Yeah. I agree that in, especially in this space, very liberating. Yeah. 
<laughs> because you're definitely working in this space, you see it the most, you probably witness it in yourself or you have over time, over the time you've been studying this, but we are act, acting sometimes as human ping pong balls where we kind of go from one extreme to the next, where we might have always blamed some external thing and been externalizing, externalizing <clears throat> all of our pains and problems. And then we hit that sign and was like, okay, obviously this isn't fixing anything. I'm going to have to change my mindset. So then we start realizing, well, if I take responsibility, I can start healing shit and changing shit. But then we go so far into that. Now we become like you're saying, Jade, almost the victim of our own response, you know, responsibility Smart. taking. <laughs> yeah. And what's so wild about it is that we're, that's actually, a, it's continues to be a way that we're not taking responsibility mm -hmm. because when we take it all on as it's all mm -hmm. me, then we feel really, really crappy that it's yeah. all me. It's all my fault. And then when mm -hmm. we're in that spiral, there's no empowerment. There's yeah. no like lens of like, okay, what's mine and what's not mine. What's, you know, what can I deal with? What I, it just becomes this overwhelming, like I'm bad, I'm broken. Boom. Worthiness friend. Yeah, right. It almost relates for me to the, the glorification of busy, the way mm -hmm. that yeah. people are so involved with all these things they got going on. They're too busy to do anything else. And oh my God, look at me. My, my workload is so intense and crazy. And it's almost like a, a pity party in a mm -hmm. weird way, but they mm -hmm. think it's the opposite. You know, mm -hmm. to me, it's always come off like a humble brag. Like, how are you? Oh, I'm so busy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I see busy as an intimacy issue. Mm. You know, so, and I think that we have an intimacy issue as a culture. We're terrified of actually being intimate with, with ourselves. Oh, so true. Mm, that's really good. So we want to remember that, yes, 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 people are mirrors in that we're constantly being activated by things from other people. And it's also fair to say that we live in a society with other people mm -hmm. and not everything is our fault. And that is actually truly empowering because then we get to play discerning what mm -hmm. is mine and what is not mine. And right. in that, we now have a tremendous amount of opportunity to both surrender boundaries. and take action, cultivate boundaries and communicate things that I think we're kind of really, it's hard to do. Mm -hmm. And when we take everything on, then it's, we get to cop out from doing that hard work of putting up boundaries of communicating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this idea of like, for example, an empath, right? This person that is so, so sensitive and like takes on everybody's emotions. Yeah. I mean, what we're really seeing is that empath is a response to trauma. Hmm. Not an I mean, enlightened I mean, yeah. human being experience. It's actually a deep inability to hold boundaries because mm. you've been taught that if you weren't hyper aware of what's going on at any given moment, you could be in danger. And so that now so we're constantly monitoring the feelings and emotions of others. We have to because we believe that we're in danger. Mm -hmm. And so we're always walking on eggshells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So being an empath, it, like we get to use our, our, um, kind of our coping skills from trauma. We get to use it as our strength. Of course, I don't want to take that away, but we do have to be aware that it's a response to trauma and therefore unchecked empath mm -hmm. is quite dangerous. Um, Boundaries is, is very, very important to learn because mm -hmm. that's the only way that we're going to cultivate the type of safety to find healing in our nervous system. Mm. Wow. Really let, let that sink in. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That's really, really good. Yeah. We have a lot. I don't, of I don't want to move on to the next topic. I know. I'm like, <laughs> I have, I have so many people in my life that I would say consider themselves especially an empath and i've seen in pain they you know suppose because they feel so um embodied in other people's feelings or so embodied in whatever way that other people affect them you know mm -hmm. and so we're putting this like holy kind of um label for mm -hmm. a really um inability to have a structured sense of self mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're totally really enmeshed in other people. And so the opportunity now is to move towards individuation, mm -hmm. learning how to be our own self in the midst of connection. Yeah. You know, again, that's where the opportunity lies, particularly in intimate relationships. Um, we have so much learning that happens in intimate relationships because so much of our stuff is activated and particularly our understanding of connection. How can we need somebody else? Because it's valid to need something from somebody else. 
again, in the spiritual community, I think we have this sense of like, meet your own needs and like, it's all on you and you can't need anybody else because you have to meet your own needs. And I think that we're missing the fact that again, biologically, we do need other people and it's fair to want other people to, to meet certain needs or else we wouldn't be able to be in a healthy relationship. There is a trade-off. There is a give and receive in relationships. And so the more that we can acknowledge that there are needs that we need in a relationship instead of taking it all on as ourselves, we start to cultivate a deeper level of boundaries, communication, responsibility, um, and a way of then being able to more deeply connect to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Your message is really comforting Mm. and really liberating. I feel like um, it's... uh, so different than what people are used to hearing and and it can make pe- what people are used to hearing can make them so hard on themselves and then it just mm-hmm. is the cycle i mean that's where cycle. i was that's the only reason why i know all of this and i'm talking about it is because that's exactly where i was mm-hmm. you know and i think that there's so much beauty in these lessons um but it's hard to kind of take in the beauty if we're not owning the shadow parts of it as well it's a lot of vulnerability yeah Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it can go to a whole nother extreme though, too. I mean, you see the other side of this where um, uh, more often than not, it's in men where they've become so hardened that they are literally toxic to themselves and the people mm-hmm. around them and in a different way than, a, than an overly empathic person might be. But they're rigid. They're and it's, rigid. The, it's like um, they're, those are both a, a trauma response. Mm-hmm. Um, neither of them are better than the other. Mm-hmm. Sure. So Mm -hmm. let's, I know we're supposed to move on to the next thing, Jade, but on that end of, of the spectrum, when you're so rigid, what is, what does that trauma look like that brings you to that place? Cause I, I know a lot of people that could heal from figuring this out in their life. Yeah. So oftentimes, um, oftentimes, uh, rigidity is a sign of a wound. Um, first off, that's for anything, no matter w- how we relate to our needs, wherever there's rigidity, there's a wound. So if you're rigid about your gym, uh, schedule and it has mm-hmm. to be this way. And if it's not this way, you kind of go into a spiral. There's a wound underneath, mm-hmm. you know, there's an invitation there to explore because ultimately the opposite, I think of, of, um, trauma response is, is a softness is a flexibility, um, is a resiliency and ability to kind of bend and be flexible. Um, so, so rigidity, um, or a kind of a shut off, um, is basically, it comes from a childhood where we're taught that our needs, we, that our needs are diminished, um, and our independence is more revered. Um, so it's like, why you don't need a hug. Like, don't be a sissy, you know, that type of attitude of like, y- you shouldn't need to be loved. Like, um, typically feelings aren't expressed, they're diminished, they're made fun of. Um, if you cry, then you're name called, that kind of environment. And it doesn't even have to be that extreme for us to kind of learn that our feelings are unacceptable, that vulnerability is too overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And the only way that we know how to now navigate the world is by valuing independence. Mm. And so I think the reason, like we live in a very patriarchal culture, right? Mm-hmm. And like, uh, the kind of patriarchal uh, from our culture typical understanding is that emotions are um, messy that you know being emotional is being um, in uh, like you can't be counted on you yeah, know you're, you're a burden almost. exactly yep. um, and so our culture tells us that feelings aren't acceptable our culture tells us to be independent so we live in a highly independent environment where we can't need other people that's seen as weak um, we have to value our intellect over anything else um, and so that's what we get we get a lot of people um, men and women and all the you know um, people in between that feel like they can't tap into their emotions they don't know how to tap into their emotions it's really unsafe and so it's better off to not even have emotions right. kind of that rigid blocked off mm. uh, I don't have emotions being needy is um, seen as too mm-hmm. much mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like we talk about this idea in one way or another on the show and, and depending on the, the direction of expertise that our guest has, they all use different words for it. And, you know, here we're talking about empathy versus rigidity, but sometimes it's omega versus alpha or feminine versus masculine. Mm-hmm. But it's these polarizing parts of that live in each and every one of us. And mm-hmm. it's figuring out how to land somewhere in the middle that is 
feels the most healthy and good for you to reside in. Yeah. I love that you said that because so much of what I'm saying isn't new and can be seen in so many different ways. You know, that's the beauty of language and the beauty of being human is that we get to understand similar concepts through different lenses and kind mm -hmm. of land in whatever feels good yeah. for us you know? Um, but in terms of like feelings, what, cause again, the worthiness wound is an emotional wound. And so developing a new relationship with our emotions is a critical component of feeling worthy in our body and in our lives and ourselves. Yeah. Um, and if we're not taught the language of emotions as children, and most of us aren't, um, we distrust ourselves, we distrust our emotions. And so, you know, learning the language of emotions is critical, um, to learning how to develop a, a different relationship with our ourselves yeah. but it's kind of like learning a new language it's like learning french you know or um italian it takes practice it's yeah. not gonna happen overnight and it feels awkward at first and you have to like work really hard and it doesn't make sense and then pretty soon it gets easier and easier um but having a, a flexibility around our emotions being able to kind of let our emotions flow being able to tune into our emotions and information that we're um kind of understanding from our emotions is key. You know, something that I mentioned at the very beginning is that trauma is in the perception of the event, not the event itself. Mm. And that's really important um, because we ought, we can't assume that something is traumatic just because it would be traumatic for us. Right. Um, there's so many things that happen to siblings where one sibling understands what happened as trauma, the other doesn't. Ah, right. Mm -hmm. It's because it's our perception of it. It's how it lands in our nervous system and how it lands in our bodies that determines the trauma. And yeah. so we can't be invalidated in our trauma. In that, we can be. People invalidate all the time. What I'm saying is that like, no one can determine whether or not something was traumatic. Only we can. That's fascinating. I feel like maybe that's something to really try to get your kids to resonate to with is the fact that it's like what you were saying in the beginning too, whatever your feelings are or acknowledging whatever your kids' feelings are so that they feel heard is I guess doing that in a sense where they now feel like they can be in that feeling and be respected. The fact that that's how they feel, even though you might have di different domestications and don't feel like that was traumatic, yeah. your sister, brother, whoever who's witnessing this situation might not feel like it's traumatic. It's, doesn't matter what anyone else is feeling because we're in our own chemical body bags, you know, these skin suits that we're wearing. We all have different makeups. We all have different things that bring us to this very moment and we're experiencing life from only our eyes. So if we feel like we're feeling, yeah, a, a terrible way, then it's, that's how we feel. That's our reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that needs to be tended to. And that's right. valid. Mm -hmm. um, our emotions are always valid. First, yes. there's no bad or wrong emotion. Second, there's no such thing as negative emotions or positive emotions. There's only emotions that are more comfortable and not comfortable. For mm -hmm. some people, happiness is a very uncomfortable emotion. Mm -hmm. You know, some people, um, sadness or depression or hopelessness is more comfortable. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So it's more helpful because it, we get more information by kind of understanding if it's comfortable or not comfortable. Yeah. All emotions are valid. How you, how you perceive something, how you understand something is valid. There is, what isn't valid is acting out, right? Mm -hmm. It's, there's, it, just because you were traumatized doesn't mean that you have now the right. excuse to be. Right abusive. I mean, right. none of that is valid. Um, but what we get to do is develop a relationship with our feelings where we get to learn more about ourselves and have a container where we can then allow those feelings to have a space that doesn't need to be let out. Yeah. yeah create an arsenal of tools mm -hmm. to, to deal with our shit. <laughs> yeah. And the inner child is one of the many, many, many tools that we can kind of put in our tool belt. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't help, you know, but it's just one of many things that like we can access in those moments when we're feeling so overwhelmed by a feeling mm -hmm. when we can, because what we're essentially doing is we're making that feeling and we're kind of um, putting it into one part of ourselves. So we get to separate ourselves a little bit from the feeling. So it's not yeah. so overwhelming. And when it's just a part of ourselves, now we can tend to it mm -hmm. versus when it's completely consuming us and it's overwhelming us, there's nothing we can do in those moments. Mm -hmm. Give up. Give yeah. in, really. Exactly. Exactly. Beautiful. So we have a question from our magic mom. Ruth says, I love when Thais speaks about white fragility. How can we talk to people about white privilege in a way that helps them understand? Oh, talk about a, a shift here. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
so one of the things that I think is really, really important when we're talking about the worthiness wound, we're talking about psychology, trauma, is that there not all human experiences are the same. We're all one, we're all same, and we all have very different lived experiences. Um, and our culture kind of um, privileges those that have certain lived experiences over others, right? So the more that we kind of identify or appear um, towards more um, identities that are accepted, the more kind of privileged position we have in our society. So for example, if we're white, you know, if we're a native English speaker, if we're thin bodied, you know, if we um, are male, have male anatomies or identify ourselves as a man, um, all those things kind of give us more privileges. If we, if our skin color is black, if we are a woman, if we are um, fat bodied or, uh, you know, if we um, kind of are more towards identities that our society doesn't find acceptable or beautiful or productive for capitalism, we're there's more um, uh, kind of um, oppressive forces that are at play that hinders our ability to have the same lived experiences as the ones most privileged. I hope I made sense with all that. But, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that like all of us have different experiences. How we are in the world as a woman is different than how we are in the world as a man. Mm -hmm. yeah. Point blank. How we are as a white person is different in the world than how we are as a black person, period, point blank. So if we have these now assumptions that we're, that we're uh, stating as fact, because that's the way that our society is, now we get to think about well, what are we going to do about the fact that some of us have identities that are more privileged than others? What's our responsibility in all of this, right? Because while we may not choose to have been white, we weren't born white, we are born with a certain responsibility that comes with being white. Um, and that means understanding our privilege as a white person. It means understanding how the way that we see the world, the, the wind on our back per se, makes us see the world in a totally different lens than a black person. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really, really, really important um, because it's very much, um, it's easy for us to believe that because we see the world a certain way, that everybody sees the world a certain way. Mm -hmm. I think women have been fighting for thousands of years to kind of point out to the fact that just because men see the world in this way doesn't mean that that's how women see the world. Mm -hmm. right? And so now the kind of big conversation in our country right now is around racism, um, you know, particularly because we have a president who is so overtly racist. You know, mm -hmm. he's really bringing the, to, the, to the limelight what has been existing in this country for a very long time, which is white supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, so he's nothing new. There's nothing new about what Trump is saying or doing. Um, but he is speaking to what's been kind of insidious and overt, mm -hmm. um, which is that people with white skin are seen as superior. And so what do we do about this? You know, and like, first... I find through my, my research that the more marginalized identities we carry, the bigger our sense of unworthiness, the bigger our worthiness wound. Mm -hmm. um, because our societal, our, the narrative of society impacts our psyche. You know, we are deeply connected with our culture. And if our culture is telling us that you're not acceptable, you know, because you're not a man, we're going to internalize that, right? And then that cultivate, that creates that um, worthiness wound. So we have a responsibility first to kind of, wherever we have the marginalized identities, we have an opportunity to kind of um, reclaim what it means to have those identities and see ourselves as not um, weaker or bad than the uh, privileged identities, but seeing ourselves as like truly worthy, beautiful individuals. That's our opportunity for those of us that have more marginalized identities, right? For example, as women, our invitation is to do the work within ourselves um, to kind of really understand that we are of equal par, if not more brilliant, uh, than our male counterparts. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of like the in internalized experience of that. Now, the privileged opportunity so those of us, for example, that are thin bodied, our opportunity is to do um, the work of understanding how our lens as a thin bodied individual has affected our ability to um, respect and honor and see the dignity of those who are not in a thin body suit. 
um, for example, like fat phobia is everywhere. It's pervasive. And it's our opportunity always to be investigating where we're biased towards thin people. For example, assuming that if you're fat, that means that you're unhealthy or that you have lack of willpower, et cetera. Mm. When it comes to white privilege, when it comes to whiteness, there is an insidious belief that white is superior. And it plays out in every single system in our country. Mm -hmm. Um, And so doing the work of understanding our bias, understanding how we're seeing things from a particular lens um, is really important if we want to honor the dignity of all humans. And then as we're doing that work, we get to decide what that advocacy, activistic you know, work looks like in our lives. I don't know if I even answered the question, to be honest, but I just kind of went on and. So (laughs) I know it all makes sense. And it's, um, it's a great answer. I'm sure what Ruth was looking for. Um, but for like, for me, I get really, really worked up over racism. Like it, um, it's something that can, um, make me pretty emotional and I can get in very heated conversations. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, in what way? Like, what do you mean getting into heated conversation? So um, if someone, if I feel, and again, there, our lenses can be very different, but mm-hmm. if I feel someone is white privileged and um, they're not seeing what people of color are going through, mm-hmm. I can get really worked up with this person, not being mean to them, but in a very heated discussion. And I'm, I'm curious how we can help someone understand without being too, aggressive and offensive mm-hmm. oh because i do feel like that's part of our 100 our, um, mm-hmm. our calling right now and it's part of why oh, trump yeah. is our president is so that this is broken open in our country and people who care about this stuff can speak out and it's i think if you ask that question you will get a different answer to mm-hmm. everyone you ask mm-hmm. right because i think there's so many different perspectives on how we need to be approaching these conversations. Mm -hmm. For me personally, and I'm not saying that this is the right way, I'm saying this is just what I've landed on in my life right now, is that what's important to me is to not drop someone because they don't hold the understanding that I do. Mm -hmm. Because by dropping them, I'm doing a disservice in the long run, Mm -hmm. because then they're going to be even more closed off to hearing it. Mm You know, Um, so what do I mean by dropping someone? You know, again, I I think this is one perspective and there's always a lot of um, caveats to this, Mm -hmm. but I don't think that like cutting your grandma off for making a racist comment Mm -hmm. is necessarily going to be the best way to support her in changing her mind. Mm -hmm. Again, lots of caveats, lots of exceptions, but overall, I think cutting people out because they don't necessarily get it in the first first conversation is a little short-sighted and we need to be holding each other right now Mm -hmm. you know we can't be dropping white people because then they're going to go towards the other way you know we have to hold our people up to the fire and the minute if we're dropping them if we're too quick to drop them then we don't have an opportunity to re-engage so how to do it without getting heated. I don't know. I, I hope somebody learns and can teach me because it feels it, it, it's very easy to get very heated about this. And I'm, I'm learning how to not, but I find that attempting to listen, to meet them where they're at, and then to slowly make some counterpoints, some counter arguments, holding their hand, being like taking them gently. I find it to be the most effective way sometimes again i want to make sure i'm adding lots of caveats to this because it's not always the case and it has to be a case by case moment but i've seen so many people in my life that i've um kind of just held them loosely so to speak mm. like you're going to change your mind i i trust that you're going to you're going to come to your senses and i'm going to support you they get there they usually get there the people in my life who have kind of been abrasive and I've kind of cut off and I told them that like, you're wrong and you suck Mm -hmm. um, are are now more entrenched in believing that they're right. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's hard. It's hard though, because sometimes this isn't, not sometimes this isn't a topic to be taken lightly and we don't want to be coddling white fragility, you know, and we don't want to be kind of like, 
oh, you, you're racist. Oh, that's okay, honey. You're still love. Right. Like, we don't want to maybe do that because that's not okay. And racism is killing people every day. And like, you know, so it's a delicate dance of like how to find our way through it. Um, but what I love about what you said, Jade, and I think this is what I would like everyone to kind of get out of this is that having the conversation is better than nothing. Yeah. And that's our greatest responsibility is to be having the conversation with everybody, with the neighbor, with the grandma, with the colleague, like ev we need to be getting into these conversations and holding people to the fire. We can't be silent about these things because if we're silent, we're killing people. Mm -hmm. Right. So like we can't try to like figure out when's the perfect time right. to say something. It will never feel perfect. We'll never feel like we're doing it right. I don't feel like I'm doing it right right now. You know, like this is not my lived experience. You know, I'm a white person. So like, I will never understand what it's like to be on the other end of racism. I, I can't even fathom it. And so I'm always playing a delicate dance of how much space do I take up in this conversation, you know, as a white person. And so it's so imperfect. It's so messy, but we've got to be doing it. Yeah. Silence is is complicity. Mm -hmm. You know, silence is not our friend. We're not going to be saved by silence. No. Yeah. I think that something that can help us wake up to white privilege also is maybe, um, you know, I hear a lot of people say like, um, I don't have white privilege. I worked my way to the top. I worked for mm -hmm. where I am, but you never had to do it. Like if, if we can remember that, like for people of color, there's like that, even though they're black, you know, they were allowed in here. They were, they were in for a white person. It's like, they're never going to have to experience that side of it. Yeah. So if we can at least maybe just remind ourselves that. It's hard when we haven't experienced it mm -hmm. ourselves to mm -hmm. imagine that anyone else has experienced it. Mm -hmm. That's the same for anything. It's like, if we've never experienced a roller coaster ride, then like it's impo it's impossible to imagine what it's like, and so it's easier to kind of dismiss it and be like, there are no roller coasters, right? It's mm -hmm. um, so it's hard to kind of wrap our minds around the fact that there's whole swaths of people who are having such a totally different experience of the human on the human plane than we are. It's it's, it's hard, it's, but then we just got to remember that the same is happening right now in the genders, you know, the same is ha like, it's very hard for men to understand what we're talking about when we're like, we have to walk like, <laughs> like there's the meme of like, what's the, a man's, I'm talking heteronormativity here for a minute, but like, what's a man's b biggest concern on a first date? Like mm -hmm. whether or not she's pretty, like, you know, if she's going to pay, you know, what's a woman's greatest concern on a first date like whether she's going to be raped whether she's going to get a, a thing in her drink you mm -hmm. know like we text our friends when we're going to meet a stranger letting them know our exact location like or uber uh, we share our location yeah right mm -hmm. so the fact that we're so unsafe you know it takes a toll on us and so if we if we're having a hard time kind of conceptualizing and understanding you know white privilege it's always helpful to kind of go into what, what is our lived experience mm -hmm. as a woman and try to connect some dots it's not the same by no right. means Means, but it's at least something that we can start kind of understanding at like how hard it is to convince a man about our lived experience. Well, you know, people of color have been yelling at us about their experience for a long time and we haven't listened. And so how can we expect men to listen to us if we're not listening to our sisters of color? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree totally that this is a super, um, I'll say that there's a lot of fear around the conversation, especially for someone who might be white because they don't know how to approach it without offending someone. But having a messy conversation is better than not having the conversation at all. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get you better at figuring out how to have the conversation so that you can get across, like Jade's asking here, the point you're trying to get across. And yeah, and the only way we get better is by doing it, Yeah, right? Practice. Like the only way that we get better at anything is doing it. Every time we talk about it, we get better and better. We understand more and more. We learn, oh, I actually still have a lot of gaps in my knowledge here. Oh, great. Now we're going to do more research and more understanding. Like, listen, I am like in by no means an expert on this. And like, I'm still very much at the learning. And so I appreciate talking about this with my friends because I get to be more aware of all the gaps in my knowledge. Like right now, there's so many gaps in my knowledge around um, all the other isms that I'm 
now doing more work to learn more about because that's my responsibility as a human being, you know, to honor the dignity of other humans is to understand their experience. Yeah. I think there's a way to, to meet people where they are, like you're saying, and, and respect the part of the journey that they're on, even if that's not where you're at and plant seeds, which they will grow into eventually, or all you can do is really do that and then have that faith because that's exactly what you're saying. That's kind of your calling as a human being on this planet. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to say before we move on to the next question, um, that for any, you know, um, any person of color who is listening that, um, you know, I feel like a lot of times we forget that, you know, their ancestors were chained up together and, and that their, um, family members were, were raped and their children were ripped from them. And it's so easy to just forget that that's a part of our history and that it was not that long ago. And so, um, you know, that we are going to continue talking about it and, um, that we're sorry on, you know, the behalf of our country and our culture for everything that is, is going on, but that we will, you know, continue to be a part of that conversation. Mm, it's so. amazing. I was listening to, um, cause I'm from Brazil, I was born in Brazil. So I was listening to Samba and Samba actually comes from black culture. Um, and it was, it was, uh, and so was the carnival, everything that we know about it, like the cool Brazilian culture, it all comes from, um, African roots and um, from slaves and, and from the culture that they kind of developed um, in in South America, in Brazil. Anyway, so as I was listening to Samba and like thinking about, I don't know what made me think about it, but I was like, everything good, like truly, like culturally rich, mm-hmm. like the do- like um, feijoada, the black bean soup of Brazil comes from Again, it comes from black culture. And so everything good about Brazil and then also everything good about the United States comes mm-hmm. from black culture. Mm-hmm. It does. Everything good. It's vital. It's beautiful. It's, it's dynamic. And it's so wild, you know, that we think that white people are superior. Yeah. Right? Like un- unconsciously. Um, and some people consciously. It's just so wild at how everything that's good about this country comes from people of color mm-hmm. comes from immigrants it comes from you know our native indig- americans yeah. it comes from indigenous peoples it, it th- that's what brings the best and yet we have this understanding of the world that it was the white europeans who were the masters mm-hmm. of humanity and who had the most that's what they taught in school advanced <laughs> technologies exactly and it, it's such a it's so wild if we don't question that it's so Mm -hmm. wild that most of us don't question it Mm -hmm. you know like we learn about thanksgiving we learn that it's this beautiful peace offering between (laughs) folks and white people and and we uh, every year are basically celebrating the genocide of indigenous people unconsciously so it's everywhere it's steeped in our understanding of everything Mm -hmm. and we must investigate it and interrogate it every moment we've got it's the most important thing we cannot talk about trauma without talking about this we Mm. can't separate the two Mm. yeah that's good Mm. a lot to sink in here in this combo already (laughs) thais all right so on a slightly lighter note we have a pick Pick your poison. So these are kind of would you rather questions yeah. Yeah, that we do okay. on every show. So would you rather all conspiracy theories be true or <laughs> live in a world where no leaders really know what they're doing? Well, that's what's true <laughs> right now already. Yeah. And you were a consultant for the government. So we but thought. You might know. <laughs> yeah. So I was a boring consultant. I did <laughs> IT management, like nothing. Nothing truly exciting, but I would say I would rather all conspiracy theories be true because it would just spice things up. <laughs> <laughs> You're ready for the other one to yeah. not be true? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh God, there are some really effed up conspiracy theories though. So you're right. What would you I choose, Jane? I would be afraid to sleep. Um, Wait. We, we already know what it's like on the side of the political, um, not you know, people in politics not knowing what they're doing. So um, I think I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and choose that because at least we can try to do something about it. Mm-hmm. Whereas the conspiracy theories, some of those, we would be absolutely fucked. Yeah, like I if know. chemtrails were really a thing and they were throwing chemicals at us every single time we saw a chemtrail, <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> The Gwen Towers, the EMF waves. I'm thinking 
There's so many. Are you 51? You're right, Jade. Yeah, I'm, so on, I change, I'm on <laughs> I'm your so, boat. I'm scared just thinking about it. <laughs> I'm on your right. boat because if if because you know aliens if we've had contact with them we probably fucked them up and now they're probably angry with us and wanting to kill us so there's a lot of things that yeah. could go wrong with that um, <laughs> yeah I I mean I guess we're all gonna be on one side on this because we are we know we have a slight amount of control with the leaders mm-hmm. the situation we're already in That's but um, also do any of us really know what we're doing I mean. No. So at what degree uh, did these leaders not know what they're doing is what I need to know to answer this I mean, thoroughly. Really, does Trump know what he's doing? Let's be honest right no. now. <laughs> no it's all on a whim. I don't know. <laughs> all right. There's a few short questions we like to ask everyone who comes on the show. So first off, if you could hug your younger self right now, which it sounds like you do often, she's a, she's a gal you keep in her, your pocket, um, what would you say to her? Oh, boy um gender language um i would say you know i love you that's it i just i love you i love you i love you i love you and i'm here for you Mm. yeah were you told that you were loved a lot as a child yeah yeah i was um my mother um brazilian very expressive very Mm. um fast to is to, to show to say mm-hmm. i love you and smother me with kisses um, mm. yeah. yeah if you could have the whole world read one book which would it be oh Mm-mm-mm-mm. i mean this is the ask like okay if if you're asking like the clinical side of me i would say the body keeps score by bezel van der kolk mm. it's a really important read Um, I think everybody needs to read Mm -hmm. that book. Um, It talks about trauma and how we understand it in our bodies. But if we're going more on the spiritual side, I would say The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Mm -hmm. Um, I I just, for some reason, that book just brings out all my warm and tingles. And like, I read it every year and it's just, yeah, it just reminds me of all the good things in the world. I feel like every, every time you read it too, it it's, you get something else deeper yeah, out of it. You're yeah. just like, yes. I love yes. the romantic side of it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty remarkable. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, someone yes. wants to join us. Hold on. You want to say hi? Who is that? Who is it? <gasps> hi, Booby. Oh, you had to look over there. <laughs> Chewy. He's like, he's right now. What's yeah. his name? Chewy. Chewy. Mm-hmm. Hi, Chewy. Okay. Okay. Like, I don't have earphones on. Who are you talking to? <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you could whisper one phrase to everyone on the planet, what would it be? Trust yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's it's good. Hard. It's good. All right. Before we let you go, where can people find you online? Uh, you can go to my website. Uh, Taisky.com uh, to learn all about me. You can also, I'm on Instagram and I'm loving Instagram. So you can join me there at I am Thais Sky. Um, I share a lot of your posts to my story. Oh, thanks, Jade. Yeah. Let me tell you, thank you both for having this conversation with me, having me on. And um, I think we went on like a really beautiful ride together. And so I'm just really appreciative of both of you and the wisdom that you are both putting out in the world through this podcast and this platform and for the conversations that you're having. I think it's not, it's not very, I, it's not very usual to find two white women kind of talking about things like mm. white privilege. I think it's important. I think it needs to be continued to talk about. And the fact that that was a part of this conversation is really important to me. It's part of my values. So I really appreciate um, that that happened. And also, yeah, just thank you for having me on. Yeah, We're, I'm so thankful. I messaged you back in like October initially to have you on. Yeah. So. Um, no, yeah, I'm glad that you reached out. Yeah, thank list. you so we, much um, for coming on. Thank you, thank you. We really hope this reaches a lot of people because it is yeah. a conversation that we need to have. I want everyone to it. hear, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, not just the white privilege stuff, but just generally like seeking whole, yeah. within and then also uh, as we need to stop doing, not, you know, stop taking Shutting all the on ourselves. everybody else yeah. 
Yeah, we, yeah. we got to stop. We don't have time for that. Like, <laughs> we got to take responsibility for what is ours. Yeah. And like, we got to move on. You know, we got work to do here. You know, yeah. we're living on a damaged planet. Like, we're literally dying, you know? Yeah. But, well, literally, we are dying every second. Yeah. Towards mm-hmm. death. But also, like, our planet is coming to, like, an epic demise. It's yeah. like, we, there is no words to describe the apocalyptic kind of experience we're having right now and so there's no there's no time to waste yeah. like this is the do the work that matters internally and externally there mm-hmm. is no time to waste and so you know getting out of your own way means understanding what's in your way so like get intimate with what's happening inside of you so that you can embrace it and love it and integrate it mm-hmm. and become this person that you were born to be and, and release the intergenerational trauma and, and step into your fullness, you know, like we just, we have to get to work. Yeah. Well, thank you so much was, for having these conversations. Really comforting. Yeah. yeah. And, thank uh, you both of you. For being such a powerful voice in this yes. realm. Yeah. yeah. We appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Ty, so um, from here, you're just, yeah. you can just close out, right? Yeah. yeah. I'll just leave the meeting. Um, thank you both so much. I really yes, meant it. Of course, we're going to air this Monday morning. Oh, great. So send me all the links so that I can share with all the things, all the people's. Yeah. We'll make some good videos. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you, awesome. both of you. Thank you so right. much. And let's okay. stay in touch, please. Yes, I'll message you soon. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay, Mercedes. So now we just need to keep recording on Audacity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, we, well, it's up. You, we can keep recording this. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's pretend she just got off. Well, she's <laughs> quite the light, isn't she? Yeah, that oh, that was honestly one of the most conver- the, one of the most comforting conversations I've ever had. Really? Yeah, I feel really, really comforted. I feel like she talked to my inner child. <laughs> yeah, like she had some stuff you needed to hear. That's awesome. Yeah, I did too. I mean, I really um, think she's she's got she's got a really uh, articulate way of putting. The information that she's she's done all that studying around out there into the world and i very think very articulate if you're willing to listen mm-hmm. you can absorb some real magic yeah. there. i agree speaking of magic mm. um <laughs> our magic tricks are up yeah and I was gonna what's do, yours well i was gonna do one based around the moon but i'll save that for another episode because something else came up for me mm. um that i've felt on my heart so i'm just gonna wing it here but uh so my magic trick is to, you know, you hear about abundance and, and to have a mindset of abundance and living in abundance. And I don't know, I feel like for most people, they tend to automatically think about finances and provision. And I have always struggled with a mindset of lack, um, but not just when it comes to finances and provision, but that's all that I thought that it was on. But I realized in these last couple of weeks that it has bled into every area of my life. Mm. That if I'm, if I feel like my job is on the line, I act like that is the only job that I'm ever going to have the ability to have. Yeah. Instead of realizing, okay, if I lose this job, there's a better job for me. There are so many jobs that I can work. And, um, just like, um, you know, now being in the dating scene, which I'm not too fond of <laughs> dating scene and all the terms, ghosting and all this stuff that oh, I, Jesus, I know. like five years ago, this wasn't going on. Um, so, you know, feeling like a connection with somebody, um, you know, I feel like sometimes we tend to think like, oh, I've never felt this. I, I like this connection is so strong. I don't know if I'll find this again. Yes. And when I thought that I was being ghosted by someone, I started to mm-hmm. kind of like panic and think like, Oh, but I have such a connection and right. so great. And he, he matches my dream guy list. And I had to stop and think there are billions of people on this planet that he, he can't be the only one that matches my list. He can't be the only one I have a connection with. And I had I, that like really woke me up to, wow, I have a feeling I have a mindset of lack in all areas of my life. And when I moved into the duplex where I was having the landlord harass me, I jumped into that duplex because I thought it was the only place that was going to be available at that price. And so I got myself in this pickle, you know, but there were so many other places available in Austin at that same price. And I moved into one that was way better. So 
We my narrow magic. our mindset sometimes. We don't see, we have blind it's a mindset on. of lack. Yeah. Um, so my magic trick is to ask yourself, where do I feel lack in my life? Where do I have a mindset of lack in my life? Because a lot of times when we are asked that, if we have a mindset of abundance, we only think about our provision and our finances, but take it outside that and say, do I have a mindset of abundance in my relationships, in my friendships, in my, um, I don't know what else, Mercedes, I don't know, my career in, in any area. Any area. Yeah. Any area. Ask yourself, is there any area that you have a mindset of lack? And then ask yourself why, and then and then do the work that it takes to transition it into abundance. Can have that talk with yourself that I had about that duplex or that guy. Yeah. And- so this is, um, this really hits home with me because I'll say, especially in the beginning of my relationship with my husband, who I consider, I considered my soulmate when I met him. Right. And but that's not now- to say that you don't choose him, but if he doesn't choose you, you can get another soulmate. Right. So now I consider him one of my soulmates. Mm-hmm. And I actually, and I've said this on the show before, I do believe that we're all soulmates waiting to be discovered by each other. And it's just a matter of alignment. It's just a matter of being open enough to align and the timing be right and all the things that have to happen for an alignment. But mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that it only happens once in a lifetime. It means if you're only open enough for it to have been once in a lifetime, then it only happens once in a lifetime. Or if you're only, um, you know, really open is, is the word putting yourself out there, you know, getting, believing that that's the case that there are more than, I don't know though that I feel like anyone could be a soulmate, but I do feel like if I feel someone is a soulmate and I choose them just because they don't choose me, doesn't mean that I can't have that with other people, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. I mean, I think in the mindset of abundance, the fact is that we are all soulmates just waiting to be discovered. And that means that's to my mind, the most abundant way you can look at things because it's not like, oh, you're going to, you know, meet anybody on the street and you're going to go, this is the person of my dreams. No, because they're, they're not necessarily aligned in this time and space. However, the core soul of who they are, the God that lives inside of them is connected to you in some degree or another and it just might not be in this you know dimension or in this time and space but if you gave it enough time and space if you gave it enough openness and you grew into that you could probably grow a connection deep enough with anyone out there if you Mm. were open enough to do that and they were open enough to allow you to do that to become what we would consider or what I consider a soulmate, which is someone who you feel deeply connected to and who, fe- who you feel understands you and gets you mm-hmm. and you get them. And that's mm-hmm. what I think that's what a soul connection is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Disney puts it out as this magical thing that happens and we find this one person and it's him mm-hmm. or no one. But when, like I was saying in the beginning of my little story here is that, when I met my husband, that became a really scary thought because mostly because of he could die. He surfs like every day. He could, you know, something could happen, God forbid Mm -hmm. to him. And then, and then what? So that's it for me for the rest of my life. Now I'm fucking bummed out for the rest of my life. And I do think, I do feel like we all have that one person, but if something were to happen, like you're speaking, or if they were to not choose us, then they're no longer our person. And then we may have another person and, and we can have another person. So just having that mindset of, of not, you know, not lacking. I also think that because we, it it comes to mind since we interview so many people in open relationships or in just alternate styles of relationships, um, that, that there is other options out there that feel good and fit for people's lives in the time and space that they're utilizing that method, like open relationship or whatever, where mm-hmm. they're having multiple people in their lives that they're considering these really deep soul connections, these mm-hmm. kindred souls of theirs, and that's allowed and okay. And when we close off to that and say, no, that's not allowed, maybe that's not for me right now in this time and space, but when we completely close to something, that's, that's basically shunting your abundance off of you, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. That's how I see it. So I think there's methods like, you know, what you spoke to in your magic trick, but also just 
there can always be more opening. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to mean that because that's, true. that's a good way to with other people being in open relationship or other people out there being your soulmate, it doesn't mean that they're going to come and steal you away or your husband has other soulmates that they're going to come steal him away or anything like that. It means that be open to all the possibilities because being close to them does not help you. Trust me. It's only your ego telling you that it helps you. And that's mm-hmm. a big, big ass lie. It's your ego saying, no, I'm the only one for him. And he's the only one for me. And you know, that's how it'll be forever and ever. And we're going to death do us, death do us part. And, and even after that, I want him to not be happy and you know, mourn my, mourn the fact that I'm not here to be with him or whatever. But the reality is that's not what you want. You do want people to experience as much love as they possibly can. That's what your highest self wants. Mm-hmm. It's your ego talking some bullshit into your ear. So yeah. Well, what do you have for magic? So I was going to have a magic trick that also had to do with the moon in the sense that it had to do with Maddie Moon, one of our former guests that we actually mm. mentioned on today's show. But since you're going to move your moon one, I'm moving my moon one. And because <laughs> so long on your magic trick, I'm just going to do this super short one that I, I really okay. like. So um, found this little quote on my yogi tea bag. <laughs> 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 and uh, it's as simple as this. It said, Trust is the union of intelligence and integrity, Hmm. which you got to just sit with that for a while. And I'm not even going to go in depth on that at all, but just say it one more time. Yeah. Thinking about this idea, trust is the union of intelligence and integrity. Hmm. And her advice was to trust yourself. There's that interesting world. Yeah. Isn't that interesting too, that, intelligence and integrity. So if you think about the idea that we as a, as a human or as any sentient being that has a, the ability to trust, right? The intelligence to trust and combine that with integrity, those two things, that meeting point of intelligence and integrity allow us to have this thing that literally is like a lifeline for all humans on this planet. All all sentient beings on this planet trust. If we can't trust in the people around us, in the gravity to hold our feet to the ground and the sun to shine every day, we can't trust in those things. We got damn lose our mind right away. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Like I think about that when all of a sudden someone you feel like is cheating on you, you have something come up, your trust is, is lacking or you did get cheated on. And now you're worried every day that the same thing's going to happen. Mm-hmm. This is just for instance, but you can think of almost nothing else. We, mm-hmm. we are completely consumed by that. So mm-hmm. integrity and intelligence, that's strive for that, strive for that and others. That's all. That is all. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> all right, you guys, thank you so much for tuning in. If you found this conversation as comforting and just as heartwarming as we did, then please share it with your friends and family. This helps us so much, you guys. We really want to have this conversation heard. So please rate, review, and subscribe. And don't forget to be a light. Be a light. Wait. I also wanted to, to tell them that we release a new episode every Monday so you can catch yeah. us next week or you can go listen to some of our past episodes in our podcast library. Um, and, and like Jade said, if you guys rate, review, subscribe, it really does help us continue to do this show and that's what we want to do. Yeah. So please, we love you so much for doing it. Thank you yes. in advance. All right, guys. Thank you. Good night. Big thank you to at Rayton Royal for our intro jam and to John Garza from Real In Motion Productions for producing this show. Stay magical, friends. Awesome. I'm going to reread one sentence that I asked her earlier because um, I heard some noise. I don't know if it was my dog or a dog outside or what, but I'm just going to reread it just in case we need it. Okay. So I know we already went into this some, but you did an amazing series on your show about reclaiming worth. Can you talk to us about that and what you call the worthiness wound? Because this really, really resonates with me. Okay. Okay. All right. Felt good to record again. We haven't recorded in so I long. I know. And the whole thing. Out of the damn loop. I know. All right. Um,